हेलो सलाम शलोम नमस्ते सताल अलोहा ओला बॉन्जोर एंड चाओ इट्स सो गुड टू बी विथ यू अगैन टुडे एंड आई नो यू विल बी वेरी हैप्पी because bola has joined us again in case you missed our first interview our first conversation with bola please check out that episode bola is a clarity and emotional freedom coach she's also an emotional intelligence expert and last time we started to talk about the four pillars of emotional intelligence and we started to dig into the first one which is about self awareness and i'm so excited bo because today we get to dig deeper into talking about the rest of the three pillars of emotional intelligence so can you tell uh, um uh, like just baka baka back <laughs> and um so happy to have you here thank you samia thank you so much for having me it's really nice to be back As always I love the residents that we have and I love the work that you do. Thank you so much. And yes, I am a Reiki practitioner as well here in the UK and I'm also a certified trauma recovery coach. And I love to talk about emotional intelligence because it is one of the key key elements of us enjoying life more, whether it's at work or at home. It's really about us beginning to see how we can look at different aspects of ourselves different aspects of ourselves and really become more wholesome more fulfilled be able to show up step up mm-hmm. and serve serve deep with grace with ease with flow not just work 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 on the grind on the grind but to have more freedom of emotions mm-hmm. to just have a um, a more enjoyable work yeah um you know we can have a passion we can go for it with all we got but if we do not have that emotional intelligence which is really about understanding ourselves understanding our emotions understanding the environment around us and valuing and appreciating our relationships we really do not enjoy the goals and we can bring and we know how goals are it's just you know you get something and it's about what's next yeah you know i want a car you get the car oh you know this car is uh, you know this this car is not good enough i was sharing a story well it's a poem that i wrote about you know how how we can really become more accepting of of change of our growth of the goals that we have mm. i remember you know wanting to be as a toddler wanting to have my own seat in the car and you know I was always been carried as a toddler but i remember that i wanted to because i saw my older brother having his own seat so i wanted to have a seat so that was my goal and i always wanted i want i want to sit on a chair you know in the back seat so i got that goal and then after a while i actually wanted to you know to be in in that you know in that front seat why why am i not in the front seat you know and then that was that was the next goal and then i got in that goal and it was like okay so this is good this is fun but i want i want to be in the driver seat i want to drive you know and then i moved to the driver seat and i began to drive and that was my goal and i loved that and then another goal came i want to be in the owner's corner at the back <laughs> and um and then i was in the owner's corner in my own car and um and then that goal wasn't enough and then after a while it was like I just want to have a good view from whatever seat I am whether it's the back or there's the front I want to have a good view. Yeah. You know, and the goals never stop. Mm. And that is life. And it's yeah. about how do we begin to enjoy life even as we go for these goals. Mm. So the four pillars of emotional intelligence and emotional intelligence I will define according to Dan Goleman is that that capacity to understand and manage our emotions as well as manage the relationships we have with others mm-hmm. so that we can have better outcomes and experiences in our lives and our day-to-day lives so the emotions that we have are key we have to understand ourselves first and it takes four pillars emotional intelligence consists of four pillars and the first we talked about last time is self awareness this is really we, where we are understanding understanding more of our thoughts our emotions our feelings sensations 
becoming more mindful about what is within us, what we have disconnected from, what trauma has made us leave behind because we have to survive. And self-awareness is about going back there. It's scary sometimes. Mm-hmm. In order for us to stay present, we have to leave the past behind. We have to, we have to bring the past back in a way and then set it behind us. Yeah. Self-awareness is about bringing that past back in a way where we can look at it and observe what is of a high vibration, what is of a low vibration. Because some some of those things in the past we want to keep. Yeah. We want to keep some of those wonderful memories. But there's some things that do not serve us anymore. And we must let them go. If we want to, it's a choice. It's a choice. Uh. Yes. And that self-awareness is the very first pillar where we are beginning to use different tools. And that's what I do in my programs. I work with clients who are ready. I hold that space for those who are ready to go into that, that past self and heal some of those traumas, some of those memories that we no longer need. And the past may be yesterday. The yeah. past may be 40 years ago. And at times when we are holding a grudge for 20 years, it mm. doesn't serve us. Mm. So learning to use different tools and forming new habits that allow us to transform fear to love mm. quicker and quicker. So self-awareness is about self, you know, self-understanding and it's about self-acceptance. Mm-hmm. And that's the first pillar of emotional intelligence, being more aware and accepting and loving of ourselves and self-management is really where we are beginning to be aware of what our boundaries are what our values are so for instance i know that parenting is one of my biggest values i have two grown-up boys now in their 20s they're still boys but they told me i'm man man we're men mom you know we're men now i'm like okay yeah (laughs) and that's part of it because when it comes to our relationships especially as parents, mm-hmm. a time comes when we have to be clear how significant we really cannot be the same as we were as when our children were toddlers. Yeah. The relationship changes and the boundaries change. And it's about how we can remain significant without suffocating that independence of our children. So self-management is key. Understanding how our different roles in at home or at work really have to be around taking responsibility for just what is our bit uh, and not trying to step over into maybe what what we did three years ago may, be, may not be what we need to do now. Yeah. So the values do change. Yes. Our values change and it's being very close to our heart. Self-management. The second pillar is about connecting to the heart. It's really about understanding what it is that is true for you, remembering that, Mm. taking time to remember that. And we only remember that when we have released the the tensions within us. Mm. When we have released the tensions within us, we have forgiven, we have done some healing, we have connected with our thoughts and we're managing those thoughts using different tools, but it's about connecting from the heart to the, from the mind to the heart. Yeah. And that takes intentional practice. So again, it's about habits, new habits, new patterns of thinking, new patterns of behavior that allow us to manage those emotions better within us. And the third pillar is about social awareness, being ready to share, being ready to share who we are, with others because you know i said this when we met last time that we are creatures of the heart and not creatures of logic and when we meet other people we are sharing with them from our heart and we are understanding their heart as well because we give that space for them to to step in and connect with us and at the end of the day we are all the same we may come from different continents, may come from different parts of the world, we may all have different themes we're exploring. But at the end of the day, connection, connection is key. It's one of our seven basic human needs, that connection. 
is so important. So knowing that we're all the same, whether you're a man or a woman, you know, whatever the gender, it's really about becoming much more open with our own stories and being open-minded, mm. non-judgmental, being ready to accept the stories and the pathways of different people, knowing that we can agree to disagree. You know, and two people can watch the same football game and come to a different feeling about it all, you know, even if they are on the same side, not to mention if they're on different sides. True, true. You know, because it's really about our perceptions. Mm. And we may watch the same thing, we may be in the same workspace, we may be in the same home. But to understand that, if I have a different perspective to somebody else, I have to share what that perspective is so they can share theirs. And we can do this in different ways. This is part of what I do to really help people to understand that there is um, that oneness between us, between us all, amongst us all. When we understand that, we're less judgmental, especially if we have learned to love ourselves. Mm. If we've done the self-awareness, and if we're doing it, and we're managing ourselves, we are coming from a place of love. And nobody turns that away. Hello? <laughs> if you're coming from a place of love, you know, you're in that office and you're asking, you know, would you like a cup of tea? Are you feeling, you know, what, um, what, what's the team like when everybody is concerned about the other, truly concerned? Because we may have differences, but we have a common interest. Yeah. We have a common interest. What is our common interest? And how do we set aside what doesn't really matter? What really matters here? Yes. And we can begin to enjoy our environment a lot more. And that leads to the fourth pillar, which is the relationship management, which is where we are really beginning to bridge the gaps, bridge the gaps between us and other people. And it's got to be from a willing place, from choice. Because I tell you, sometimes when you have been betrayed, you don't trust anybody anymore. You know, it's like, hello, I trusted you yesterday. And you said you have changed, but still you haven't changed. And it's about coming to understand that change starts with us. The relationship that we have at home and at work are dependent on our own inner world. The happiness that we seek outside starts with that happiness within us. So when we have done that self-awareness, we are managing ourselves. We are aware of the social difficulties and the social joys you know around us we come to a place where we can really see our relationships from a little bit of a detached place when i say detached from an overview we have an overview we're not expecting people to do things in a particular way we are seeing the way they do it and we are understanding why they're doing it that way but if it doesn't fit the collective, there's a way we can go about it. We can be angry, but we can be clear within ourselves why I'm angry. We may even be angry at ourselves, not necessarily at the other person or the, or, or the group. But as we become more aware of ourselves, we are aware of what the emotions mean to us as they arise. As the triggers come, we know why. We're clearer on why the triggers are there. And we're not reacting in anger. We're able to manage ourselves. And our relationships only get better when we do that. So those are the kind of four pillars of emotional intelligence. And they really help us to appreciate those around us even more. They help us to enjoy the work we do. Because what is the point of just getting on with the goals and working day in, day out? without enjoying life true true you know we've got to enjoy this life because life was not meant to be a struggle as you know Stuart Wilde said in his book but it takes a lot of faith you see because a lot has happened to us all mm. 
And, you know, but as Martin Luther King Jr. said, faith is taking that first step, even when you cannot even see the staircase. Mm. You know? So trusting, trusting that even though things may be difficult or, or a bit tight, you can actually get to a place where, you know, you take that faith, you take that first step mm. to become more self-aware. Yeah. Then you find yourself being able to manage yourself a lot more. Ease and flow. Something happens and you understand it. Yeah. And you are filled with love and compassion to find relief for yourself. Because being quick to find relief takes compassion. Otherwise, we're staying in it. Why should I bother giving myself some nice feeling? <laughs> you know, you have to love yourself, really love yourself, and understand the worth that you have. That's true. We are love. You know, we are love. Yeah. So, yes. oh. so that's a quick summary of emotional intelligence. Thank you for sharing that. And you shared so much that's like so deep and so rich and there's so many things that I want to follow up with you on and I think the thing that's coming to me um, most right now is what you were just talking about in terms of like the self-love component and there's so many different aspects to the self-love in terms of how it impacts us and how it impacts our relationships I was, while you were talking, it made me think about um, actually when I came to America, my family immigrated here about 21 years ago. And um, very, so like within the first couple of years after we immigrated here, 9-11 happened, the terrorist attacks on American soil, right? And in the aftermath of that, you know, there's this huge wave of Islamophobia and discrimination happening against Muslims in America. And in those days, you know, I used to be a very introverted person. I was very socially challenged and awkward and, uh, you know, because I was still in the process of recovering uh, mm -hmm. from the trauma I had experienced as a child being sexually abused. And um, the really uh, interesting thing that happened when I, I suddenly felt this wave of Islamophobia mm -hmm. and, we, you know, being targeted with this hate for something that I felt like, why? Are people targeting me like I had nothing to do with this it's not something I believe in it's not something that I support I have no idea where this even came from into my life like it was just as shocking for me as it was for everyone around me and yet I was you know there's just all this blame and judgment um, being thrown at me and it, but it's like hard to deal with that, you know, and I, I think it took me like several years of coping with that before I got to a point where I was able to love myself enough yes. that then the Islamophobia and discrimination, even uh, though it continues to, I continue to experience that on an ongoing basis, but now it doesn't bother me anymore in the mm. way that it used to. It doesn't trigger me um, anymore the way it used to because now I'm, uh, that I'm so much more grounded in self-love, especially in the context of my identity as a Muslim. I've come to love my, my faith, my religion, and really just uh, love my own understanding and practice of it. And I feel so grounded and, and confident in that, that now when I'm faced with people's hate or doubt or whatever it is that they're experiencing, I'm still able to stay calm and happy and confident yes. in myself. Yes, well done. Yeah. You chose. 
you made a choice. Mm. You made a choice and it's hard work because the world divides us. Mm. It's a divide and rule, divide and conquer. Yeah. And it's, you know, different themes, different subjects, you know. If it's not with religion, it's with color. If it's not with color, it's with gender. Yes. It's it's a consistent, consistent on a daily basis. This is why our intentional practice has to be daily. Yes. And it takes a lot of faith, a lot of compassion. And self-love is a part of self-care because mm. we're looking after our body, eating well. Mm. And, you know, it's, you know, yeah, there may be some, some orientation towards not eating particular things, but knowing what is good for your body, what works for you, what works for you, what makes you feel good based on your beliefs, based on your, or, you know, on, on your experience, your own experience. There's so much, there's so much to self-care. Yeah. You know, it's about the body, it's about our minds, it's about the people we surround ourselves with. Yes, that's you know. true. And it's hard work. Mm. It's hard work. So well <laughs> done. Oh, thank you. It's, it's not something that, um, you know, comes easy to deal with because um, everywhere you turn, at that time, you must have seen, you must have seen the hatred everywhere from mm. no fault of your own. And it was all about divide and conquer, as opposed to truth. Yeah. What do you do in that place? Do you still stay outside looking for validation? Or do you come in yeah. and remember the truth of who you are? The yeah. truth, which is hidden always. Mm. The truth, which we, which we, dis, you know, it's, it's almost like, you know, we're torn from it. And just when you think you have a bit of truth, it's torn away again, you know. And you have to come to a place where you are determined, no matter what, resolute, zero tolerance, uh, zero tolerance to disconnection from your world. Mm-hmm. That is such an excellent point. You know, this, what you were describing about, okay, you feel like you got a little bit of truth and you're connected to it, but then feeling like it gets ripped away from you. And then to have that commitment to keep coming back to it is definitely in the context, that was definitely a huge aspect of how I came to be so loving and comfortable within myself, in my identity as a Muslim, that, you know, my faith got challenged, my my beliefs got questioned, but I feel really blessed and just so grateful that I was able to find answers that the you know to the questions that were really challenging me and it actually like the way I believe and practice my faith now is not the same as before I experienced all that hate and Islamophobia being directed at me I actually have a I used to be super dogmatic actually (laughs) in my approach to religion and that was actually part of my my survival mechanism in terms of uh, dealing with trauma because I, I had so many issues of power and control and one of the ways that I tried to bring about a sense of greater control in my life was I was like okay I'm going to learn all the rules to how to live life and I'm going to follow the rules and knowing the rules and following the rules gave me a sense of like here's something I can control about my life and that actually made me very dogmatic in the way that I understood and lived my religion but so much of that dogma got challenged by the hate and the Islamophobia and if I had not released that dogma um, I would have had to I don't know I mean I was having crisis of faith and I would probably have had to abandon my faith. Um, but thankfully, I was able to release the dogma instead and find a, a much, much more loving and compassionate and easy way of relating to and understanding and living my faith. Um, that also makes me so much better in the context of relating to other people and being yeah. open to understanding them and their faith and spirituality and so forth. 
coming from a place of love. Yeah. That is... Coming from that place of love. Because yeah. uh, when when we follow that, you know, that conditioning, or when we follow what what feels right, what is part of our society, it may serve us to a point. Mm. When we begin to feel lack of love. Yeah. When we begin to read it, because sometimes we don't feel it. Yeah. We have become numb to it. Mm. When we and that's that's some um, that's part of our flow. Numbness, dissociation is part of our flow. It's yeah. part of our survival. Yeah. When we begin to feel discomfort and we are self-aware mm. and we're managing it. And we're looking around us and we're finding that this discomfort has been caused by the outside. Mm. we are becoming much more aware of what on the outside serves us and what on the outside do we resonate with because we are not an island we have to interact with people around us Mm. but you are identifying the things that no longer work for you Mm -hmm. and you are going to a place of love within you because it's from that place of love within you that you can begin to perceive love outside yeah. It's from that place of love within you that you began to see less Islamophobia. Yeah. There will be people around you that still see it on a second by second basis. But from that place of love within you, you are able to identify and perceive a different social awareness. And you were managing your relationships in a different way. So you've got to come from a place of love, no matter what discipline, no matter what dogma no matter what kind of faith you're following Mm. if you're not coming from a place of love the outcomes that we have do not sustain us and we certainly do not enjoy life as we could but it's a choice it's a choice because i know there's some people who have come into this earth plane to explore all the darkness of it (laughs) and i certainly avoid those people (laughs) But I see them, I see them, and it's a choice. Yeah. So I love how you made that choice to come back to that place of love and to stay there, keep coming back, keep coming back. Yeah. It's a daily choice. Yeah, you know, you, you have this point about making the choice, that it is a choice, that it is your choice to make. This is such a critical, crucial point. Um, Oh my gosh, like when you were talking earlier about being a parent, this also had, you know, popped into my mind about the choice um, issue. Um, Oh my gosh, can can you just tell us a little bit more about what can hold someone back from making that choice of living peace, living love, living more joy. Like when people when, when people are stuck in that not joyful, not happy, not loving place, um, and, and, and you and I are coming from a place of awareness where we realize, we recognize that, you know, you're choosing to stay stuck in that in that place. But like, you know, to my mind, I know for the longest time, it didn't make any sense. Why would I choose to be unhappy? Why would I choose to suffer? So how can people understand that, like, why they're, they're choosing to stay in that place and how they can shift to make a different choice? Yeah. In psychology, we call it learned helplessness. Mm. Because when you are a child, and you start out knowing what you want, which is children are very wise, very intuitive. They're not, when I say wise, it's not like they can cross the road. <laughs> but they have a sense of what the basic needs are in the present. They're very present. And that gets taken away. Mm. And they begin to realize that, or they begin to form the perception, we begin to form the perception as children that we have to do things in a particular way, otherwise we will not be loved. Mm. Otherwise we will be punished. Otherwise no one will care, we will be abandoned, rejected. We begin to feel shame and we begin to have all these emotions cultivated in us. 
and we feel helpless. Mm. We, we are made to feel that we cannot make the right decisions. We're made to feel that we are not worthy of certain things. So we have to do certain things to be worthy. When we are already worthy, we are part of divine essence. How can we not be worthy? This is this is what we have to connect to again. Mm. But the learned helplessness started from, you know, that helplessness started from childhood. And we learned it and we can learn it. Mm. But it takes the intentional practice. It takes the choice. And sometimes my clients will say, Paula, you know, how am I going to do this? I said, I'm so glad you're here. That's the first thing. That's the choice, the willingness to unlearn. Mm. The willingness to unlearn that we can make a choice. To unlearn that we cannot make a choice. Mm. Because when you are helpless, you don't think you can make a choice. You're stuck. That is what we all feel when we have been through that childhood, when we have been through that conditioning, when we have been through that government divide and conquer. Mm. that elite divide and conquer so it's about knowing that this this what is going on for us and choosing if we want because at first we do we will not know how it will play yeah. we will not know this 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 choice i'm gonna have to make how am i gonna make that choice but being willing in the very first place to unlearn the helplessness is the first thing and it takes faith mm. it takes courage and you can only start from where you are everybody's in a different level different place and sometimes we have ups and downs you know and, and we think we're in a straight line like that but i always tell my clients that we're actually going like this each time we go up we're going higher than we did last time we come down we're going higher so it's up and down but each each high is actually higher than the last high. And each low is not as low as the last low. So the ups and downs are normal life thing stuff. That's life. But we are learning. We're learning. And it's about coming to accept that, that we're learning and we can begin to learn to empower ourselves in an empowering way. We're always we're either learning to disempower ourselves even more. Or we're learning to empower ourselves even more. And we find that we are learning something. We're sabotaging ourselves less, but we can do it even much more intensely. Mm. And I say intensely, much more instinctively, spontaneously. Uh -huh. When we allow that, that divine essence within us from the heart. When we allow the heart to heal mm. and to flow. We find ourselves being more spontaneous in love, in taking action. We find ourselves just saying, oh, I need a parking space, and the parking space arrives. You know, we find ourselves going, oh, I, oh, I need to have a really, a really nice car, but I only have 20 cents, you know, oh, I'm going to have a nice car. And then we surround ourselves with that, you know, that empowering mindset, that empowering set of, you know, actions. Because there's something about having an empowering mindset, which is taking certain steps, having a vision board, visualizing what is powerful as opposed to visualizing the do. There's certain things we can do, even when we have 20 cents and we want that car. But we can only do it from a place of love. Mm. So self-love is key. Mm. Self-love is so important. And then we can begin to show a willingness to unlearn the helplessness. Mm. If anybody who is thinking, I'm going to um, become that millionaire without actually understanding the power, the power of self-love the power of self-worth it's gonna take a while it's gonna take a while so that self-love is where we start to begin to really 
um, unlearn the helplessness and we cultivate, we cultivate the power of choice, the power that we have. But it's, a, you know, it's using different tools in different ways. And it takes about 66 days, researchers show, to change our habits, an average of 66 days. You know, and that's what I do in my program. Over a period of two months, we actually go through and identify what are the limits, what are the definitions, then begin to connect more with that stillness, that love within us. Because I tell you, when you have leaders, leaders who really lead from the heart, they connect more with what the people want. Right. They connect more with what serves the others around them as opposed to what serves them. And we can serve ourselves because really we need to have our cups full but we don't have to be greedy. You know, we need to have our cups full in order to help others. Mm -hmm. We really need to understand, which is why self-awareness, self-management is key. Yeah. And social awareness, understanding the differences, but still coming to a place of commonality. Mm -hmm. And then managing our relationships. And those, those things require us to unlearn our sense of helplessness. Mm -hmm and know the power of our choice, the power that we have within us. Imagine all people coming together in that way, that connective power, it's powerful, really magnificent. Indeed. And on that inspiring note, even though I want to keep asking you more, and more <laughs> questions, we are going to wrap up. I love talking day. about it as well. I, I, I <laughs> You, and I'll probably have to call you back again. Not probably, almost for sure. For <laughs> surely we'll call you back again and we'll keep talking. Thank, uh, you. thank you so much again, Bola, for giving so generously of your time and sharing your wisdom with such 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 grace and such um just beauty. You're, you're, uh, I, I just feel this amazing beauty in you and around you and in your spirit i really really appreciate that thank you samia i really love talking to you your questioning your your approach your work i so love this conversation we've had thank you so much hey thanks for tuning into this episode hope you're getting value out of it for your information, this episode has been sponsored by the Happiness 101 program. Are you a change maker, coach, trainer, or healer? Are chains of fear holding you back from making the impact and income you desire? Using a unique combination of positive psychology and the spiritual wisdom of our most effective change makers, the Happiness 101 program helps you break through your limiting beliefs and manifest the abundance and success you desire with fun and ease. Interested? Book a free Happiness 101 exploration call with me, your happiness expert, Samya Vano. Just use my online calendar link in the show notes.